Hey guys, Francis here. In this video, we are going to look at the electrophoretic mobility, which is the second key mechanism in capillary electrophoresis that governs the separation of charged analytes. So by the end of this video, we will be able to answer these questions. How do we separate anions, cations, and neutral species in capillary electrophoresis? When the voltage is applied across the capillary, the cations will be attracted to the negatively charged cathode. The anions will be attracted to the positively charged anode, while the poor neutral species remain stationary. Since neutral species are not charged, they wouldn't be affected by the applied electric field. And there are two major factors that affect the electrophoretic mobility of a charged analyte. First of all, the electrophoretic mobility is directly proportional to the ionic charge on the analyte. So if the analytes are of the same size, the cations that are more highly charged will move faster towards the negatively charged cathode, while the anions that are more highly charged will migrate faster towards the positively charged end node. Secondly, the electrophoretic mobility is inversely proportional to the frictional retarding force of the analyte. If the analytes are of the same charge, the bulkier cation will experience a stronger frictional retarding force, therefore moving slower towards the negatively charged cathode. Similarly, the larger anions will move slower towards the positively charged anode. In addition, the frictional retarding force of an analyte not only depends on the size, but also the shapes of the analytes, as well as the viscosity of the medium. The more viscous the medium is, the slower the electrophoretic mobility. In summary, the electrophoretic mobility is directly proportional to the ionic charge on the analyte and inversely proportional to the frictional retarding factors, such as the size and shape of the analyte, as well as the viscosity of the medium. Or it simply means that the electrophoretic mobility is directly proportional to the charge to size ratio of the analyte. But there is a catch here. Since the electrophoretic mobility is related to the frictional retarding factors, the size that we are referring to here is not the ionic radius of the analyte, but the stoke radius. So the next question is, what is stoke radius? Stoke's radius of a solid is the radius of a hard sphere that diffuses at the same rate as the solid. It is closely related to solid mobility, factoring in not only the size, but also the solvent effects. In this experiment, the solvent we will be using is ultra-pure water. So in this case, the Stokes radius is closely related to the effective hydrated radius of the analyte. It is possible that a smaller ion with stronger hydration may have a greater Stokes radius than a larger ion with weaker hydration. Now that we have learned about both the electrophoretic mobility and the electroosmotic flow. It is time to combine them together. The total velocity of a solid is equal to the sum of the electrophoretic velocity and the electroosmotic velocity. For the neutral species, their total velocity is equal to the electroosmotic velocity. For the cations, we can find the total velocity simply by adding the electrophoretic velocity and the electroosmotic velocity up. For the anions, take note that the electrophoretic migration is in the opposite direction of the electroosmotic flow. However, the rate of electroosmotic flow is generally greater than the rate of electrophoretic migration of individual ions. Therefore, in this case, after combining both electrophoretic mobility and electroosmotic flow, both anions, cations will move towards the cathode. 
with different migration rate depending on their ionic charge and stock radius. We can use the travelator as an analogy for explaining how capillary electrophoresis works. Imagine the travelator is travelling at a constant speed towards the cathode. This represents the electroosmotic flow, the flow of the bulk solution. And the cations and anions are like the little kids running on the travelator. And for some reasons, we can see this phenomenon quite often in local shopping malls. Imagine the ice cream represents the negatively charged cathode at one end of the travelator. When kid number one, the dication, sees the ice cream, he'll run towards the ice cream as fast as he can, while his little brother, kid number two, the monocation, runs slowly towards the ice cream. And then we have kid number three, the neutral species, who doesn't really care about ice cream, remains stationary on the travelator. On the other hand, imagine we have a unicorn soft toy which represent the positively charged end node at the other end of the travelator. When kid number 4, the mono anion sees the unicorn, she screams and runs towards the unicorn, while her bigger sister, kid number 5, the di-anion, runs faster towards the unicorn than her. But neither of them are faster than the travelator. So overall, they will all move towards the ice cream at different rates. So now that we have learned about the underlying principle of how capillary electrophoresis works, in the next video, we will be looking at the practical aspect of capillary electrophoresis. This diagram here shows an electrophorogram of CE. It is pretty similar to the chromatogram we obtained from HPLC. So the key questions for the next video will be how do we extract information from an electrophorogram of CE? We will be talking about three aspects of an electrophorogram. The migration time, which is the x-axis, the absorbance, which is the y-axis, and the peak area, or more accurately, the corrected peak area, which is directly proportional to the concentration of individual analytes. So see you guys in the next video. Bye.